<clears throat> There's more seats up here in the front, I think. There should be enough chairs. Okay. So, what are we talking about here today? I had a plan to speak about something um, here in Light and Life. Um, and my plan was to prepare on Saturday. Okay? Um, but then as I'm sure most of you know by now, we had a tragic event take place late Friday night, very early Saturday morning, which, for those of you who don't know, is the passing away of a young man from our church. His name is Eric. He was a 20-year-old college student at Randolph-Macon, and he passed away in the blink of an eye in a car accident um, late Friday night. So I said to myself, I have to say something on Sunday, but somehow everything that I was going to talk about before, I just couldn't concentrate on. You have to excuse me on that one. So here's what I'm going to do today. I want to speak today um, a mix of from the top of my head, but also from the bottom of my heart. Okay, Somehow a combination between those two may not be the most well-prepared message, but I just want to share something with you, and I just want to kind of basically tell you about my last 24 hours, okay, and just kind of put some things into perspective for all of us. <clears throat> Friday night, I got home kind of late, and that's when I got the phone call that uh, our friend Eric was in a, in a serious accident, and uh, things were... First time I heard it was bad, second time I heard it was really bad, third time is when, um, you know, we found out he wasn't going to make it through. The first thing that popped in my head, you know how this year the theme of our church is about one year to live, and we were saying about, come on guys, get ready, because we have to be prepared by the end of the year that we could go. Well, it looks like we had the wrong theme, because there's no such thing as one year to live, and God wants us to be clear that uh, some people may not even make it one month to live. And it was very, very clear that God was giving us a message, okay, a clear message that we have to take this stuff seriously. Death has an interesting way of putting things into perspective. I think you'd agree with me. When death hits close to home, it has an interesting way of making you think about the exact same things in a completely different way. As soon as I found out, the first thing I did, the first thing I did, was I went and woke my wife up at one o'clock in the morning, whatever it was, and I gave her a hug, a big hug. And she, if she'd have let me, I'd have go waking up my kids as well and giving them a hug, but she'd have killed me because she'd have been the one to stay up with them. And then the next thing I did is I got on my knees and I prayed. And I didn't know what I was going to pray for, but I just got on my hands and knees and I started to think to myself, like, again, when, when death is around you, you start to see the same things in a different light. So I started to think to myself of all the things that I am thankful to God for. All the things that I am thankful to God for. And I am thankful... No one on this earth has a right to be more thankful than me because all the good stuff God has given me. And then I wanted to think to myself, if I could narrow it down, what am I most thankful for God? Or f what am I most thankful for from God? And God's done a lot for me. Given me a great wife, two kids. He's blessed my life, like good health. Like no one can ask for more than I can ask for, than I've been given. But if I had to think to myself, I'm like a top 10 list kind of a guy. So I wanted to know, what is at the top of the list of things that I should thank God for this day? And I came to the conclusion that the thing that I am most thankful for, without a shadow of a doubt, is God's forgiveness. More than his life, like him giving me life, more than him saving my soul, more than him 
blessing me more than anything else I'm thankful that he is a God of forgiveness and that his forgiveness is limitless let me give you two verses and these are just two that I chose quickly I could have brought a hundred verses for you Jeremiah 31 34 for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more I am very thankful for this verse Micah 7 18 and 19 I'm very thankful because who is a God like you pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage he does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy he will again have compassion on us and he will subdue our iniquities you will cast all our sins into the depth of the sea I am thankful that God cast my sins into the depth of the sea I am thankful that he pardons my iniquity and that he forgets my sins and he will remember them no more I'm thankful because I know myself and no matter how good I try to be I know I'm always gonna fall short of his standard but I am infinitely thankful that he is forgiving we spend so much time and so much effort either complaining about what God doesn't give us or worrying about whether he will give us and we don't spend enough time to be thankful like in light of eternity in light of forever the car the job the girl the guy the promote forgiveness keep the other stuff keep it don't give me a car don't give me a job don't give me any friends at all give me forgiveness give me mercy give me compassion give me cast all my sins into the depth of the sea and for that Lord we are eternally grateful the bottom line is this I don't want to go into depth in theology or anything like that but the bottom line is everyone sins and as long as you sin everyone sins and everyone dies those are two facts of life everyone sins and everyone dies and the fact of the matter is if you have sin sin and heaven cannot coexist sin and heaven cannot like light and darkness they cannot so if you have sin you can't have heaven this is a problem God solved the problem by paying the price for our sins and taking the sins onto himself so that we could then go up to heaven and then on the cross he said the famous words it is finished when he said it is finished what was he speaking about he was speaking about the price for your sins the forgiveness all the stuff that needs to be done for you to be forgiven is finished before that minute you were finished okay it would have been you were finished but after that it is finished for that I'm thankful and I'm not only thankful that he forgives but I'm glad that God is aware of the tough economic economic times as well and God knows how tough it is out there and God knows how difficult it is for us to scrounge up some pennies here and there so you know what he does he gives this great gift away absolutely free no price oh no, no let me say that again no cost to us free you don't gotta buy it you don't gotta earn it he gives it away free Romans 3 verse 23 to 25 for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God that's what I said a minute ago everyone sins everyone dies this is a problem solution being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed truly this is a reason to thank God a reason to thank God if you were here on New Year's Eve we spoke about heaven and hell what I have discovered after after that night I asked people what did we talk about on New Year's everyone says hell <laughs> I said you know we talked about heaven no one remembers heaven only remember hell hell we talk about how hell is scary and hell is real and seems to be the thing that's stuck in everyone's mind all those things are true and in light of that in light of that we get a verse like this where God says freely I save you from that and I give you my forgiveness free you know some people after 
after the hell, when we talked about hell, and there was like a video clip about what one guy imagines hell would be. And some people came to me and said, well, I don't know if that's true and not true, and you know, my answer is, it's, it's not true. I'm sure it's worse. It can't be better. It's hell. Imagine the worst thing imaginable. And it's worse. Based on all that, I view my forgiveness and I say, thank you, Lord. And I say, thank you that you saved me from that. When you realize, I said a minute ago that the gift is free. It's not exactly accurate. It's kind of free, but it's kind of very expensive. The difference is, it's kind of free for you, but it's kind of very expensive for the one who paid the price. How he paid the price, the term propitiation by his blood. Propitiation is a great word, which no one knows what it means. Propitiation means that God doesn't... <clears throat> okay, sometimes we think like what I call the whiteboard salvation, which is, I have sin, every sin is like a mark on a whiteboard, I confess, I repent, it's like erasing them. It's not accurate. Because when that happens, where does the mark go? I don't know, it just kind of vanishes into, I don't really know. That's not how, how sin is. Sin doesn't just kind of, no, make no mistake. Every sin must be judged. Every sin must be judged. Every thought, word, deed, even desire of the heart, any sin must be judged. And it must be, like, paid for. Propitiation means not that he just gave it, but it means it, like, it has the implication of, like, like, scratched everyone out. Okay? Like, each and every single sin. Propitiation means each and every single sin cost him scratching it out and cleaning it out and scrubbing it out one by one. And you can imagine every one of those was a whip on the back or a crown of thorns in the side or a spit in the face. That's propitiation. That's propitiation. It's not an easy process. It's a very difficult process. It's a squeezing. It's propitiation by his blood. It's not a la-di-da-di-da. -di -da. Forgiveness. Can you think of a better gift that someone has ever given you than that? Can you look at that gift and then go home today and complain that God hasn't given you a raise? That God hasn't solved your headache? That your ankle hurts or your back hurts? Can you? Can you receive? Can you be that ungrateful to receive that gift and say, eh, Let's get on to more important matters. <clears throat> Practically, question. If this is such a great gift, and it is so amazing of a gift, how come practically I don't feel it more? Like, maybe you're sitting there and saying, yeah, Boone Anthony, you're right. It is a great gift. And I don't say thank you enough. And I'm not overjoyed enough about this gift. I get distracted by other things. Why? Why is it that this gift so great is not on the forefront of our minds all the time? Answer is because we don't repent enough. What I want us to talk about the rest of today is this idea which I put up here. The door to forgiveness is repentance. If we kept our forgiveness at the forefront of our mind, we would never be sad, we would never be ungrateful. But the doorway to forgiveness is repentance. And the doorway is open exactly as much as you decide to open it. Said another way, why we don't experience forgiveness enough is because we don't go through repentance enough. And if you open repentance door this big in your life, this is how much joy you will feel at God's forgiveness if you open repentance this big. And those who choose to open repentance this big will have this much joy, and this big, and so on and so forth. 
Repentance is your call. The door or, or the inside is here. And it's full of good stuff. And it's chock full of forgiveness and salvation and joy and peace and great things. But the door to enter is repentance. And the reason why we so often have such little joy and experience God's forgiveness in such little ways is because we only crack the door of repentance only so wide. Once a year repentance. You want once a year repentance? Then you have once a year joy. You want a half-hearted repentance? Then you get half-hearted joy. Whereas the one who learns to truly repent will experience and live in light of God's joy every single day. <clears throat> what I'm saying is this. The problem is not on the forgiveness side. The problem is on the repentance side. God has as much forgiveness to give as we are willing to take and as we are willing to grab onto. The limitation is on our side with repentance. For many of us, this doorway of repentance is like an emergency exit for use only when there's a fire or in times of, of great emergency. We want to make this a revolving, okay? Or a, one of those like free-flowing where we're constantly going through the door of repentance and grabbing from his forgiveness. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So often we're scared to go through the door because we think the other side is a throne of condemnation and a throne of smitest and thou shalt notest and that's why we get scared to use the door. Oh how foolish because nothing could be further from the truth. On the other side of that door is not condemnation. It's grace. It's a throne of grace. And available is mercy and grace to help in time of need. Will you enter this throne of grace on an emergency just when there's a fire? Or will you learn to use it more regularly? See, I believe that repentance believe it or not, I know it seems backwards, is the key to a life of joy. Repentance is the key to a life of joy. And there's no true joy outside of true repentance. Acts verse, thir verse 3, verse 19. Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Hey, could you use a time of refreshing from the presence of the Lord? Could you use that these days? Man, I could. What's the door to get it? Is repent. Think about it this way. Let's do a practical example. Go back in time. Okay, go back. Way back in time. To when you first, when you first started with God. Not started as a young child, but when you first, like it clicked, like you got it, like you realized your sin, you really repented, like you really, really repented, and you really tasted of God's forgiveness. You cried, you prayed, you remember that time? Maybe that time, like I remember it very clearly for me in my life. I've been coming to church since I was a kid, but it wasn't until I was in my college years that that time, I remember it. I remember that time I was in love with God. And I always say, and I was just saying uh, to a bunch of people the other day, I always think to myself, and I was telling this to a group, I was a much better person back then than I am now. Ten times better, no doubt. Hands down. I was much, much, much better before, back when I was a young college idiot. Because I really, really, really knew God's forgiveness. And it was fresh. And every day I woke up and said, I don't care about nothing in this world. All I care about is God. You remember that time you were in love with God? You actually, actually wanted to pray? Actually? You actually said to someone else, hey, let's pray? You remember that? Remember when you used to set your alarm early? Early to pray before coming to church? Or you used to come to church and actually care about what's going on? You remember? You remember that time? What was the difference between then and now? 
What was the difference? The difference is always one thing. Back then was repentance. Back then, I knew where I belong, and I knew that God put me in a place I don't belong. Back then, I realized the gift of forgiveness. Now, now I'm experienced in my spiritual life. Now I pray for God to bless me. And I pray for God to give me more stuff. And I stopped thanking Him for His forgiveness. <clears throat> Back then, I used to say, Lord, have mercy. And it meant something. I used to fast, and it was a true fast. I used to pray, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. And I could pray that one line 10,000 times from the bottom of my heart. Now, yeah, 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 God, have mercy on me, forgive my sins, but let's get to fixing some stuff in my life. And don't forget to solve this situation. And it wouldn't hurt if you sped up the process here and then have mercy on me. Maybe we need to stop spending so much time thinking about what we want God to do for us and we spend more time thanking Him for what He has already done for us. And then maybe the joy will return the same way that it used to be. The spiritual life is dynamic. It is not stagnant. And for many of us, we have no joy because our spiritual life is this block. Okay? Here is my spiritual life. Sunday morning does this from 9 to 11.30. Then there's coffee break. Then there's this. And then there's this on Monday. And, this, and it is, there it is. There's my spiritual life. And every now and then say, hey, it's Lent. Hey, you know, throw something on top. Then we say, hey, it's after Lent. Hey, let's take some of it back for a little bit. And here's the spiritual life. Come on, man. What kind of relationship in life is that? What kind of relationship? I go to my wife. Here's our marriage. We will hang out on Mondays from this time to this time. And then you will speak to me on Tuesdays from this time to this time. Come on. The spiritual life is a relationship. It should be dynamic. You know what makes any relationship? Like every relationship in life has highs and has lows. Has goods and has bads. Has fighting, has making up. What makes a relationship or, or like a, a business relationship into an intimate relationship? I would say two emotions that don't exist in a business relationship but do exist in a intimate relationship. And those two are opposite ends of the spectrum. Rejoicing and sorrow. The spiritual life, if it is not full of rejoicing and sorrow, it is, I'm sorry to say, dead. It's dead. If it is not full of rejoicing and sorrow, it is dead. It is not a relationship. It is fact. And too many of us, our, our, our spiritual life is based, it's facts, okay? Heaven is good, hell is bad, so therefore I go to church and therefore I do these acts. We don't need facts. We need a living relationship with God. A living relationship must be based on rejoicing and sorrow. If my heart, if I'm a human being, and I don't cry, and I don't laugh, I would argue that I'm not really living. Would you agree? If I don't have tears, and I don't have the laughter, then I, I would say I'm living a subhuman life. That ain't life, that's a robot. Life is made up of tears, and life is made up of laughter. And never lose these, either of these two in your relationship with God. I'll give you an example. Okay? True example. Okay? And luckily my wife isn't here. Okay? So I won't get in trouble until at least she listens to this online. Okay? Hey, death is in the air. I got no problem confessing. Tell your personal stuff. Hey, no problem. Anything, we'd be clean. So I remember one of the lessons I learned early on in my marital life. Now everyone's listening very intently. I can see that. Everyone is woken up. People are bringing people from outside in the street. <laughs> I learned this lesson of rejoicing and sorrow. Early on in the marital life, you know, marriage, especially at the beginning, is full of 
highs and lows. And what I always say to couples, they hate it when I tell them this. I always tell couples when they come for premarital counseling, I always say, you guys are in love and you guys are this. When is the first major fight of your marriage going to happen? The honeymoon. And they always look at each other and say, no, I can't. I say, come talk to me after. It's always. And it's always the end of the world. It's always and it's always. But it's not. You get through. And in fact, usually, the low and the fight leads to making up and more intimacy. Getting angry and getting like upset shows that you care. In a business relationship, I don't care what you do. I don't care. I'm not, nothing you do is going to make me angry. Nothing you're going to do. What do I care? It's not worth it. Like some idiot on the street says, Say, hey, Father Anthony, you're an idiot. Say, you're an idiot too. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever I'm going to say. I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't care. It's not going to bother me. My kid calls me an idiot. That bothers me. Makes me angry. See what I'm saying? True relationship has some upsetness. So I remember in the beginning of the marriage, probably in the first year sometime, don't know exactly where, just like any other couple, we had highs, we had lows. I'm a very analytical person. Extremely analytical. Too analytical. And it must annoy her sometimes. I said to myself, I am going to cut out the lows. I'm going to cut out the lows. I'm not going to allow us to go into fights. I'm not. When something annoys me, I'm just going to... And if something annoys her, I'm just going to, you know what, okay, no big deal. Even if I don't fully agree, no big deal. I'm going to cut the lows. I just invented like a great theory. I just solved marital problems. Marriage has highs, has lows. I'm cutting out the low. Nothing's going to get me really upset. I thought I was doing a good job. Was I doing a good job? By cutting out the lows, what had I also done in the process? Cut out the highs. Why? Because what was happening as I was cutting out the lows, not allowing things to get to me, we were slowly drifting apart. And our relationship was slowly becoming more and more business-like. Not through anything, but through my stupid decision that I'm not going to allow us to get low. I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to get upset. And I'm not going to allow her to get upset either. I'm going to play it even Steven. I'm going to play it Joe Cool. And what by doing that in the process, I was inhibiting the intimacy that we could have because I was holding a little bit back. This upsets me, let it go. Now this, now this, and grow, slowly, 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 we started to drift. Until finally, she, who's much more intelligent than I am, said, something isn't right. And she's the one who got to the bottom of it, that I had been withholding the negative and also capping the positive. What I'm trying to say is that in any relationship that is a static relationship, I'm sorry, that is a dynamic relationship, that is a live relationship, there will be times when there's sorrow. There will be times when there's anger. There will be times when there's pain. But there's also times when there's joy. You know the root of why our spiritual life is so often dry and there's no joy? Because we cut out the sorrow. We cut out the sorrow. We cut out the repentance. We cut out the weeping for our sins. We cut out even examining our sins and saying sorry for our sins. And in so doing, we also cut out the joy of forgiveness. Spiritual life has to be, has to be this model. This is the model for the spiritual life. For, this has to be the model. That weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Weeping for a night, joy in the morning. We cut out the weeping, and then we're shocked when the joy gets cut out. The root of spiritual death or lukewarmness or whatever you want to call it is lack of repentance. What I would like to do is inspire you to live a life of repentance and joy. 
The two go hand in hand. You will not live a life of joy until you learn to live a life of repentance. I'm not saying to repent. I'm not saying to repent. I'm not saying to confess. I'm saying to live a life of repentance that would lead to a life of joy. Look, we said this year we're living like it's our last year. And I think based on the events of recently, we better fast forward the timetable a little bit. And we better live this month as if it's our last month. And if we're really smart, we better live today as if it's our last day. Because like I said, there was a guy who was sitting right where you're sitting a week ago. And he woke up and he got in his car on Friday morning ready for a year to live. And he didn't make it to Saturday. If I told you you're going to die tomorrow, first thing you do is repent and confess. It's the first thing. You don't wait. You beat down the door to see the priest to repent and confess right away. If you know that's what you need to do, maybe we should learn the lesson and we should do it before it's too late. Because you cannot guarantee tomorrow. And you are a fool if you do. <clears throat> if you take all of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and summarize it, what did Jesus come to preach? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I'm not telling you just repent because the end of your life is at hand. I'm telling you, even if you live for a hundred more years, repent so that you can live in the kingdom of heaven today. So that you can live a life of joy today. So that times of refreshing can come to you today. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 and 23. Beautiful verse. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. They are new every morning. His mercy is new every morning. Why is his mercy new every morning? Because a repentance is supposed to be new every morning. A repentance is not supposed to be something I did last year, last Holy Week, last retreat, last month, last whatever, and then God just gives me one mercy, and he just lasts has an expiration date two months away from now. Every morning, he has new joy new mercy new compassion do you have new repentance or you're stuck imagine if the milk did go sour every day imagine the milk doesn't last more than one day imagine that the, that's God's mercy. Why are you drinking old milk, man? Why are you drinking funky milk? Why are you drinking chunky, chewy milk? <laughs> Sorry, visual. <laughs> That's what a lot of us are doing in our spiritual life. And we're chomping away on the milk. They were chewing it. We're saying, uh, when does this milk stuff end? I want to go home. I want to spend, spend another day with God you're chewing funky milk maybe it's time for you to repent and start tasting some fresh milk the joy of forgiveness is truly not comparable to anything on this earth and as good as that joy is the stink of the old repentance is equally as bad book of revelation our lord jesus christ speaks to the angels of the churches, to the church in Sardis, he says, I know your works, that you have a name, and that you are alive, but you are dead. That you are alive, but you are dead. What is he saying? You are alive, but you are dead. My fear is that's what he's saying to many of us, is that you're walking around, your eyes are open, but you're dead. You're dead. Your spiritual life is dead. You haven't repented in ages. You haven't experienced my joy in ages. 
You walk around like a zombie, like a robot, saying that I'm alive. You're dead. What should I do, Lord? Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard, hold fast and repent. Remember the joy of forgiveness. Remember his mercies. Remember and repent so that you can be alive, truly alive. Look, I said to myself, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know if I'm going to be here. I don't know if you're going to be here. I don't know if I'm going to be here next week. I don't know if you're going to be here next week. Today, I'm getting it out. And I'm telling you, there's a great joy that's available to you. And there's a great gift that's available to you. The greatest one ever. Ever, 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 ever. Will you go and grab it? How wide will you open the door of repentance to receive that gift of forgiveness? I don't want any of us to be walking around as dead, alive but dead. I don't want any of us to have the period in their relationship with God that I had with my wife, where it's just business as usual. And I'm not going to go too down, but I'm also not going to go too up. And and slowly, we're going to distance ourselves. Maybe this is your chance to live again. I want to leave you with this verse. Psalm 86, verse 5. And again, this is one verse. I, could have, I had like 50 verses, but they wouldn't fit on the handout. I'd bore you with all of them. So I'm just choosing a sample. There's 100 verses in the Bible that say this exact same thing. That you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. For you, Lord, are good. You are ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. There's two halves. There's God's mercy and God's forgive. And that verse says God is ready. All of heaven and earth, all of God is ready. And here he is with mercy, with joy, with refreshing. And he is just waiting to see who will call upon him. God's side is ready. God's side is ready. The question is, is your side ready? Are you ready to live? How wide will you open that door to God's refreshing and his life? Question I leave you with. Let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Lord, we thank you. Truly, we thank you. We thank you, thank you, thank you that we can stand before you at this moment and all of our sins... All of them, dear Lord, are ready to disappear in light of your forgiveness, in the light of your mercy, and you are ready to cast all of our sins to the bottom of the ocean. We thank you, dear Lord, that you never judge us according to what we deserve, but you judge us by your grace, and you judge us according to your mercy. Lord, create in us a true spirit of repentance. We need need your Holy Spirit to create in us a spirit of repentance that we can live this life of repentance and that this message wouldn't be something that goes in one ear and out the other. is isn't something we just live with for a day. Lord, we want to be married to you for a lifetime. We want always to be growing closer to you. Always be full of joy. Always be full of life. Never be, never be dead and, and like zombies. So please, dear Lord, reveal our sins to us. Give us a true spirit of sorrowing for our sins so that we may bask in the beauty and in the joy of your forgiveness. We pray, dear Lord, for each and every single person who's here. We pray for the repose of our brother Eric. Pray for each person who is mourning his loss in any way, that you wouldn't just let it to be an earthly mourning, but let it to be a godly mourning that leads to repentance, which leads to joy. Pray that that you would take care of us this day and and just keep us close to you and and just wash us from any, any stain which gets in the way of us repenting, a true repentance. We ask this in the name of our Lord, our God, our Savior, and our King Jesus Christ, with the intercessions and prayers of all of your saints. Hear us, Lord, as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. 
Through Christ Jesus our Lord, thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please have a seat for a minute. Just a couple quick announcements. All right, I'll run through these announcements quickly. There's a uh, f- uh, food drive okay, going on. MLC is doing a food drive, and you can make a huge difference by helping some people out with some canned foods and things like that. You can check the website out for more information, or there's a contact number right there. Uh, that's going on uh, as we speak. Okay. Next announcement is a about uh, somehow the things not the don't know what the next announcement is. Sorry, a little help from the back. There we go. Uh, ski trip. The Yam the Young Adult Ministry is taking a ski trip on Saturday, February 21st. You see the times right there. Um, you can go on the church website for more information, or contact Yam at stmarkdc.org. Next announcement is this coming Sunday is a little thing we like to call the Super Bowl. Okay, so the Young Adult Ministry is inviting everyone to a Super Bowl party. Um, check out, again, stmarkdc.org slash yam for details. Um, struggling today. Um, as announced before, today is the kickoff of a new ministry called the New Cops on the Block. And um, I'm sure most of you guys saw, I got a chance to see the nice video that we made, which... Um, <laughs> Basically, it's a ministry for all those who are not uh, born into uh, the culture. And um, basically, we're going to get together today. And you know how uh, we always feel left out. We're going to make fun of all the Egyptians today and how we're much better than them and things like that. No, I'm just joking. But um, we're going to have a, a, a get-together today. Uh, and you can see, uh, come let me know if you don't know where it is or something like that, and I'll let you know. We're going to go right after we finish here. We're going to start heading on over there. And the hosts are already there, so... Whoever gets there first gets to eat the most. Okay, so have fun. Um, Coptic Orphans, a nonprofit organization that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is currently looking for a donors relation associate post. Anyone who's interested in that position can check out their website or email jobs at copticorphans.org. Also, this information is on our website. And last announcement I want to tell you guys is that next week, um, it is the Super Bowl. Okay, but it's also um, going to be a slightly different schedule here at St. Mark's. There will be um, one liturgy instead of two next Sunday from 8.30 to 11 a.m. Um, and the reason is that after the liturgy, uh, Light and Life will not be here. It will be in the church, and we'll have a very special presentation um, kind of tying in with this whole one year to live theme, and it's called Living the Mission. Okay, so it's going to be after... There'll be one liturgy, so we all be together. We'll be inside the church right after the liturgy finishes. So um, just want to let you all know about that, okay? Go in peace. May the peace of God be with you.